invite you to find a Bible this morning and open to the book of 1 Corinthians. We continue today with the second in our series of three studies on 1 Corinthians 13. I would like us to introduce our thoughts again this morning with verse 13. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. On Valentine's Day, the world celebrates love, a Cupid kind of love, a love that can be so very warm and yet can grow so terribly cold, a love that can be so exciting and yet can become so boring. When we say this morning, love is the greatest, we're talking about a Christian kind of love. What's the difference between a Cupid kind and a Christian kind? In our first study of 1 Corinthians 13, we suggested that Christian love is charity, as it's written in the King James Version, because it is a givingness. Christian love is other-centeredness. Today, we're going to focus on verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4 gives us five characteristics of other-centeredness. Five characteristics of Christian love. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. First of all, other-centeredness is patient. Verse 4 begins, charity suffereth long. That is, it is patient. Somebody has said that genius is nothing but an uncommon aptitude for patience. That thought, I think, is exemplified notably in the life of Thomas Edison, the great inventor. During his lifetime, Thomas Edison obtained over 1,000 patents in the United States, along with many worldwide patents. Probably his most famous invention was the electric light bulb. We see evidence so many years later. He also invented the phonograph, the motion picture camera, a stock ticker, a mechanical vote recorder, battery for an electric car, so many things. Patience was one of his greatest attributes. When he was trying to develop that light bulb, he tried thousands of times without success to get success with his light bulb. And of that time in his life, he wrote, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. <laughs> he also said genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. He also said the reason a lot of people do not recognize opportunity is because it usually goes around wearing overalls looking like hard work. <laughs> and finally, he said our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try just one more time. Patience, perseverance. Young people know that school takes patience. 
Very few students fail in school because of a lack of ability. Most students who fail do so because of a lack of patience. The assignment is long and he gets halfway done with it and he says, phooey on it. He runs out of patience. Or he sits down and the problem seems very difficult and he can't seem to grasp the concept. So after a couple of times through, he just throws the book across the room and says, that's it, I can't. He's out of patience. I suppose I must have been about 17 when my dad took me out on the highway to learn how to drive. He'd taken me in town a few times. My very first time, I remember I ran the first stoplight I came to. It's like so nervous about <laughs> learning how to do it. But I don't think I'd ever driven on the highway up to this point. And I had the most awful time keeping that car in the center of the lane I was supposed to be in. And I was kind of weaving back and forth trying to find out how I could gauge where I was in the center, you know, because I'm on the left side and... You know, it's, I'm not sitting in the middle. I'm like, why can't they design a car I could just sit in the middle and just point it straight ahead? But then I learned as I drove a little bit that from where I was sitting, if I sighted over the left front fender of the car, and I kept that fender right on the yellow line, and kind of made that my target, I would found myself in the center of the lane. And so I drove all the way, I think some 20 miles, looking over the top of that front fender and focusing on that yellow line. And I did pretty well, I think, but then we came to a long curve in the road. And the yellow line kept moving. And I couldn't keep up with it. And the first thing I knew, the right front wheel was off on the shoulder. My dad said, stop the car. And he grabbed the wheel and he gave me some tremendous counsel. He said, Steve, you will steer straighter if you look further down the road. You've heard the expression, aim high in steering. Paul is telling us this morning that we need patience that we tend to steer much straighter if we manage to look a little further down the road, if we aim high. Even prayer, folks, takes patience. A lot of us have developed a very ineffective and a very haphazard prayer life because we don't have patience. Because the exasperating thing about God is not just that he only sends the right answers, but that he also only sends them at the right time. And we give up asking in disgust and we feel that God has let us down long before that time comes. We have not developed patience in prayer. Like the one woman who prayed, she said, Lord, grant me patience, but hurry. Patience is needed in soul winning. We are told that there is a key to every heart. You get the picture, you have a huge ring with all these keys on it, different types, sizes of keys, and you stand at the door trying to get in. There is a key to every heart. There is some way to reach every man, woman, and child. There is a key. But we try one and it won't go in, and, and we try another and it won't turn, and then we either kick the door down or we walk away. Now, if it's someone that we love very much or we're very close to, we tend to kick the door down. Someone who's very close and precious to us, like one of our children. If they don't behave, we're going to read them the riot act and break down the door. We're going to do something aggressive to try to reach through to them. But then if it's some neighbor or stranger or somebody that we don't care quite so much about, we just shrug our shoulders and walk away. Well, I guess they just don't have any interest and we move on. Soul winning takes patience. Keep trying. Keep trying, 
Keep trying. There is a key to every heart. Look at the life of Jesus. And notice the different ways that he dealt with different people, but always with love, always with patience. Love gives us that kind of patience. Love is patient. It doesn't give up. Next, love or other centeredness is kind. Verse 4, charity suffereth long and is kind or gentle or considerate. Keep your place here in 1 Corinthians 13 and turn with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew for just a moment. Matthew chapter 12. There's a most interesting analogy in Matthew, the 12th chapter and the 20th verse. I'd like us to notice that Jesus was noted for being kind. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 20, which is actually a repeat of a prophecy by Isaiah. In Isaiah 42, 3, the same words are used. Matthew 12, 20, a bruised reed shall he not break. Now, whatever does that mean? A bruised reed, will he not break? Years ago, we used to have a pretty good sized pond in our garden. And in that pond, we had a lot of reeds growing up. And you could just reach over and kind of twist several of them in your fingers. They're very easy to bend, to break. A reed is not very strong to start with, but you notice there's something more here. This reed has been bruised. It has already been bent. It has already been twisted. It's just about to fall apart. It needs a gentle touch. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench. Smoking flax. In Paul's day, this was probably a wick made out of linen, typically. And the wick here is burning, but it's not burning very well. It's a smoking flax. It's just about to go out. It needs to be sheltered. You've all probably at some time started a campfire or some kind of fire, and you, you kind of want to be very careful with it and protective of it and shelter it, keep the wind out. Jesus had a sheltering hand. Jesus had a gentle touch. Jesus was kind. Other-centeredness makes us kind. But kindness requires awareness. What a great miracle that when Jesus came, the hungry were fed. What a great miracle that when Jesus came, the hurting were healed. But perhaps it may have been just as great a miracle was that Jesus was aware when people were hungry. Jesus was aware when people were hurting. You see, I think that most of us are other-centered enough to want to help hurting people. Our problem is that we're too self-centered to be aware when they're hurting. If we knew they were hurting, we would help. But we're too interested in ourselves, too little interested in them to know when they hurt. Jesus went about doing good. We just go about I went with a pastor a number of years ago to visit a family in the church at the request of a friend. Lovely family. But somehow, because of certain circumstances in the home, they were having serious trouble in the raising of their children. The children were in trouble with the law, and they were in trouble with the school. And when the pastor and I came to the home and expressed a concern and tried to let them know that we cared about their situation, we were received so warmly by the family. The family's attitude was most appreciative. 
And then the father turned to the pastor and he said, you know, you're only the second person that has ever come and said you cared. The first person was the one who had sent the pastor. The father continued, I know that they must care, but nobody has come. And they were such a lovely couple. They were leaders in the church. They were leaders in the community. They were people of such overwhelming respect. Hard to realize that people like that could be hurting so much. My dear fellow worshiper, perhaps someone within touching distance of where you sit in your seat this morning is wearing a mask to keep you from seeing the tears. And you don't have to march up and down the aisle in order to find somebody that's hurting because there is somebody that is very close, but you are too busy adjusting your own mask to even know. There's a poem written by Edwin Arlington Robinson back in 1897, very poignant poem called Richard Corey. Whenever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentleman from soul to crown, clean favored and imperially slim. And he was always quietly arrayed and he was always human when he talked. But still he fluttered pulses when he said, good morning, and he glittered when he walked. And he was rich, yes, richer than a king, and admirably schooled in every grace. In fact, we thought that he was everything to make us wish that we were in his place. So on we worked and waited for the light and went without the meat and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. There is many a heart bleeding this morning under an immaculate suit coat or a lovely dress. And this is where in a smaller church, we have an advantage over those giant mega churches, the impersonal churches. We're small enough to get to know each other. We're small enough to know who's bleeding. We're small enough to know who's hurting. Small enough to develop the closeness and the warmth and the friendship that we need to be able to help each other. In fact, this is one of the principal reasons the church exists, to care for each other, because charity is kind. Thirdly, other-centeredness is not jealous. Notice again verse 4. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, charity suffereth long and is kind, and then charity envieth not or charity envies no one. It's never jealous, it's not possessive. My name is A, my friend's name is B, and we have a close relationship. But B makes a new friend whose name is C. And suddenly B and C are spending all their time together. They don't have any time for me. My natural instinct is to hate C and pout at B. But other centeredness finds happiness in their happiness. Jealousy presumes that only my happiness counts. Folks, you're never going to find very much happiness in this old world until you can be made happy by the happiness of others. Or oh, we see it in our closest relationships with those that we love the most. Something good happens to my wife and it makes me happy. Recently, our youngest son had his second child 
and we rejoiced with them and their child. A mother is not jealous over her daughter's beauty. Not if she loves her daughter. She embraces it. She's happy about it. Father is not jealous over his son's success. When we have other-centered love, we celebrate the happiness of others. Now the fourth characteristic of Christian love. Other-centeredness is not anxious to impress. Verse 4 again. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. That is, it's not anxious to impress. It's not boastful. Isn't it nice, first of all, to know that charity is not anxious? You see, it's a lack of love that makes people anxious. Remember on your first date how anxious you were? And you wanted so desperately to make a good impression. But somehow when you had that inevitable awkward silence, your whole body reversed itself. Your palms got wet and your mouth went dry. And you wished so much to have it the other way around. And you were anxious because you were not sure that there was love. But eventually you found out that there was. And now you can sit all evening and not speak and not get a dry mouth or wet palms. As one friend told me, he said, I don't talk much, but I love to have my wife go with me on a trip. He said, we may go most of the morning hardly saying a word, but I just love having her there. You see, we're anxious when we're not surrounded with love. Love takes away the anxiety. It makes us comfortable. We're saying that other-centeredness is not anxious to impress, and it's not boastful. Now, boasting suggests a lack of self-love. Please be very kind and understanding toward the boastful. The boastful man is not usually the man who believes he's accomplishing such great things. He's usually a man who deep down thinks he isn't doing much of anything right, actually. And what he's usually saying with his boasting, oh, if you knew what I was really like, you wouldn't like me. So I'm going, going to try to make you think I'm something different from what I really am. That makes him boastful. A person who is boastful lacks self-love. Now, what is self-love? Some people think self-love, that's selfish, that's sinful, that's prideful. That's not what we mean when we refer to self-love. Self-love means self-respect. It means self-confidence. And Christianity ought to give us some self-confidence and some self-respect. The Lord Jesus Christ believes enough in me that he made me and he's remaking me every day. Amen. And he died for me. And so God must find something worthwhile in me. How can you believe in Christ and not believe in yourself? We won't take the time to turn to it, but in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 12, Paul says, The Lord make you to increase and overflow in love one toward another and toward all. Paul talks about a love that overflows toward one another. Now, the overflowing love gives me an image of a pitcher, an overflowing pitcher. May I suggest a couple of lessons from an overflowing pitcher? Number one, a pitcher cannot overflow until it's filled. You can't overflow love to the world around you, to those who are around you, until you have love inside of you. Self-love is an absolute essential to be able to love everybody else. But secondly, you cannot fill a pitcher with acid and have it overflow milk. What fills the pitcher will overflow the pitcher. If you have a sick self-love, you will have a sick love life toward your husband or wife or your children or the world around you or your fellow church members. Whatever is inside of you is what's going to come out when you overflow. 
And may I suggest someone on the side here, just one little lesson that has kind of turned my whole thinking around. It might do something dramatic for your interpersonal relationships. I know it will if you take it seriously. Imagine, if you will, an unhappy person, a bitter person, an angry person whose love or lack of love is like a pitcher full of acid. Now, when that pitcher full of acid overflows, when it drops just one drop of acid on me, my instinctive reaction is to pull back. Ouch! That hurt. You hurt me. Shame on you. You hurt me. But listen, if one drop of acid falling on you hurts that much, why not instead think for a moment of how much it must hurt to be full of it? And finally, the fifth thing that we want to look at in our verse, Paul says that other-centeredness is humble. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. A very descriptive phrase, not puffed up, that is not inflated. In Paul's day, when they would fill their bellows with air, you know, to fan the fire, they would use that word, puffed up. You see, self-love says, I am something. But humility says, I am not everything. And without God, I would be nothing. Yes, I am something because God is making something out of me. Hallelujah. Boys and girls, once there was a donkey, as the parable goes. And when he returned to the stable at the end of the day, he just couldn't wait to tell all the other donkeys what a day he had had. Why, he said, as I walk down the street, people line the street on both sides to see me walk by. They put a robe on my back. They threw clothes down beneath my feet, and they cut branches from the trees and laid them out in front of me. And then they shouted, and they sang songs to me. Now, we'll forgive him. He was only a donkey. He didn't realize that all of this was because Christ rode upon his back. But God forbid that you and I should be such donkeys that when something good happens to us, we think it's because of us and not give credit to the fact that any good thing that you have, any good thing that you do, any good thing you are is because of some gift from the Lord Jesus Christ. James 1.17 tells us every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God is not variable. He is only good. He is only love. Is not puffed up. People who seem religious to themselves are usually people eaten with pride. A false Christianity, a wrong religion, is one of the sickest things that can happen to the human psyche. I believe in God. I've given myself to God. Therefore, I am something special to God. I am unique to God. And it's too bad the rest of you around me don't have God like I have God. He has traded 10 cents worth of pretended humility for a dollar's worth of pride. And he thinks that he's doing business with God, and all the while the devil is snickering up his sleeve. And I mean to be kind, but if you somehow feel that you have a religious experience that impresses you with the fact that you're better than the world around you, it's not the real thing. 
To those of you this morning who are not sure of yourself, please go from worship today knowing that God loves you as much as he loves anybody else. And for those of you who come somehow spiritually superior to the rest of the world, please understand that God loves everybody else just as much as he loves you. And so in just that one verse, Paul is teaching us that the loving man, the loving woman is not jealous. They're not anxious to impress. They're patient. They're kind. They're humble. Please, dear worshiper, do not go away from church today and say, I'm going to try and be like that. You see, when you have the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, Paul is saying that it's natural to be like that. You don't get that way by trying. When you have love in your heart, it's natural to be like this. It's just not natural to have the love of God in your heart. That takes a divine miracle. And that's what Jesus was telling Nicodemus in John 3. He said, except you be born again. Now, what does a baby have to do to get born? What part does a baby play? A baby doesn't provide any of the power. Baby surely doesn't provide the life and the strength. All the baby provides is something that a baby can do better than any person in this congregation. He provides the yielding. And somehow his bones are a little more malleable than they'll ever be again in his life. You know, when a baby is born, I'm sure you've all noticed the two soft spots on the baby's head, the fontanelles that are called. There's a posterior fontanelle, which is a small soft spot on the back of the head. It takes about four months after birth for those bones to fuse and to make it solid and protective. Then there's the anterior fontanelle, a larger soft spot on the top of the head. That takes about 18 months to fuse. The baby spends an average of 12 hours squeezing through the birth canal. You mothers know what I'm talking about. It's quite a process. But the baby's part in the birth experience is the yielding. He's got those soft spots and his bones are are softer and more malleable. And so he works his way through that birth canal. His part is the yielding. I'm going to ask every one of us today to experience once more today that new birth experience. How do you have the new birth experience? The only kind of an experience that can, by divine miracle, implant the love of Christ within your life. How do you do it? It begins by yielding to the Holy Spirit. And when we are yielded, the Holy Spirit will fill, will fill us with the love of Christ. By beholding, we become changed. Don't you want that kind of love experience in your life? I know I want to change. I want to be more like Jesus. Jesus so loving with such other-centered love for God so loved the world that he gave. He's always giving to his children. Let's yield all. Let's surrender all to Jesus today. Our dear loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful today for Jesus, for your love, your immeasurable love for each one of us. Lord, today we want to be more like Jesus. Lord, help it not to be a situation where we're just trying hard and trying to do good things and good deeds. Paul has told us to fight the good fight of faith. Help our fight. Help our efforts to be towards 
building that relationship with you. Every day going to you for the bread of life, for the water that helps us to never thirst again. May we seek Jesus every day so that we may become more and more like Jesus. May we see that demonstrated in our personal lives, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, and in our church. May we surrender all to you today. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.